Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. In this video, I want to look at a common but confusing aspect of characterising amorphous materials. Why it is that the glass transition temperature of a material varies depending on how it was formed and how it's measured. At first sight, this seems crazy. Surely, a particular material has a well-defined TG. But no, the actual TG you measure will definitely vary depending on how fast the sample was called and on the technique used to measure it. Understanding why that is will really help you understand your sample better. So I say, let's get a drink. I, of course, have a coffee. Mm. And let's make a start. If you've watched some of my other videos on amorphous materials, and if you haven't, then very handily, the links are in the description below, then you'll know that I like to use a plot of energy or volume versus temperature to explain how glasses are formed. In previous videos, I've kept the graph relatively simple, and I depicted the glass transition as being a sharp discontinuity, like this. That was helpful in the earlier discussions but it was somewhat of a simplification, because it implies that there is a sudden temperature at which the viscosity of the supercooled liquid becomes so high the material fills and behaves like a solid, and we form a glass. That allowed us to discuss glass formation and the glass transition temperature. But you might not be surprised to know that in reality, glass formation is a little bit more complicated than this. When we look at melting on this diagram, we see a sharp discontinuity at a specific temperature. And that is because melting occurs at the temperature at which the crystal has enough energy to overcome the intermolecular bonds holding the molecules together in the crystal lattice. Since all the bonds are the same, they will all require the same energy to break, and hence will all break at the same temperature. The structure of glasses, on the other hand, is ill-defined and there will be many types of intermolecular interactions occurring, all with different strengths. That's why, when we talk about glass formation, we talk about an increase in viscosity, because viscosity is a bulk property of the material which we can measure, and which is proportional to the rate at which the molecules can move, the molecular mobility. It doesn't matter where the molecules are, which is handy because we can't measure that anyway. Rather, the rate at which the molecules can move is determined by the strengths of the interactions between them and the overall temperature of the system. As the temperature reduces, the molecules have less energy and move more slowly, and hence can interact with each other more strongly. This will increase viscosity as temperature reduces, leading to glass formation. However, as I think you might have already seen, we won't form a glass at a specific temperature simply because there are so many ways in which molecules can move and interact. Rather, there will be a gradual increase in viscosity over a temperature range, and our graph will look like this. Melting is called a thermodynamic transition, because the only thing stopping a crystalline material from melting is energy. Once it has sufficient energy to overcome the bonds in the crystal lattice, it will melt instantly with all bonds breaking at the same time. What this means is that it doesn't matter how quickly a crystalline material is heated. We will always see melting occur at the same temperature because bond breaking occurs very fast. This has implications for how samples appear in a DSC at different heating rates, by the way, as we've looked at in a separate video. Glass formation, however, is a result of the rate of molecular movement reducing. And because it is a change in rate, glass formation is a kinetic process. This is very important for two reasons. For one, changes in rate require time, which is why the glass transition does not appear as a sharp discontinuity. And for another, it means the temperature range over which we see glass formation will be affected by cooling rate. 
What does this mean for our graph? I hear you ask. Well, time is not actually shown on either of the axes. So changing the rate of cooling just means we move along the supercooled liquid line faster. It doesn't change the line. However, now we must remember that as we call the supercooled liquid, we are reducing the energy available to the molecules, and this will slow their rate of movement, allowing them to form ever stronger interactions with near neighbours. But because this takes time, the sample response lags behind the change in temperature. For instance, imagine cooling the sample by 5 degrees centigrade. This would cause the molecules to move more slowly, the sample volume to contract, and stronger intermolecular bonds to form. Let's say it takes one minute for all the molecules to move and the new bonds to form. If I cool the sample slowly, say at one degree per minute, then cooling by five degrees will take five minutes, plus another minute for the sample to react to the temperature change. I will therefore see the sample response one degree lower. The sample has cooled by one more degree centigrade in that minute. On the other hand, if I cooled the sample more quickly, say at 10 degrees per minute, then the reduction in temperature by 5 degrees would take 30 seconds, but the response of the molecules will still take one minute. And in that minute, the temperature has dropped 10 degrees. So I see the sample response 10 degrees centigrade lower. I have, of course, simplified that discussion, and there are lots more complexities in real materials. But in principle, we can represent forming of glasses of the same material at two different cooling rates, like this. The faster the rate of cooling, the lower the temperature at which glass formation is seen. In this way, one particular material can have many different glass transition temperatures. It all depends on how it was formed and, in particular, on the rate of cooling. When we say an amorphous material has a glass transition temperature of x degrees centigrade, we should really be careful to say also when formed at y cooling rate. This is why glasses formed by different methods, say quench cooling, spray drying or freeze drying, often have different Tg values. The actual rate of cooling in each method is different, so the final Tg will be different. There are other differences caused by these methods, but let's leave that for another video. So, because glass formation is a kinetic process, it will be affected by the rate of cooling, and therefore the process by which a glass is made will influence its Tg. Is that why? It's possible to measure different Tg values for the same material when different anatomical techniques are used. Hmm, good question. And the answer is partly. If you agree with me that the measured Tg will be affected by the rate of cooling, it should not be a big leap of faith to see that the Tg might also be affected by the rate of heating. <laughs> that is, when we heat a glass starting at a temperature below the Tg, the temperature at which we see the material progress through the glass transition to a supercooled liquid will also depend on the heating rate because, yes, you guessed it, it's a kinetic event. As ever, the sample response will lag behind the actual temperature of the sample, so the temperature at which the glass transition is seen will be higher with faster heating rates. This is exactly what we see for glasses when heated in a DSC. Higher heating rates lead to higher measured Tgs. So right there, we have to be careful. If we state the Tg of a material as measured by DSC, we must be careful also to state the heating rate. But there's more. <laughs> there are loads of techniques that you might use to measure a glass transition temperature. For instance, dielectric spectroscopy, DSC, or dynamic mechanical analysis, or DMA. The sample glass analysed with each of these techniques will give a different Tg. Why? <laughs> That's because any analytical technique is responding to a particular change in a sample. For dielectric spectroscopy, its movement of dipoles 
in an electromagnetic field. For DSC, it's a change in heat capacity, and for DMA, it's a change in mechanical strength. As you might imagine, movement of a dipole only requires individual molecules to move, and so dielectric spectroscopy is very sensitive to the start of a glass transition. DSC can only detect a glass transition once the heat capacity of the sample has changed significantly, which will only be once the glass transition is well underway, while DMA is sensitive to a bulk change in a material's mechanical strength, which will only happen as the glass transition is complete. Thus, dielectric spectroscopy will tend to give a lower TG value, DSC a slightly higher TG value, and DMA an even higher value, even when used for the same sample material. Worse, as if it can get worse, as I noted already, changing the parameters used for a particular measurement can also change the measured TG. Heating rate will affect the TG seen in all the techniques, for instance, and the frequency used in DMA will also change the measured TG. What does this mean? <laughs> well, for one, amorphous glasses are tricky. You can measure a TG, but the value you get depends on how the glass was made and also how you measured it. Your best option, therefore, is to specify everything when reporting a TG. Is that done in the literature? Um, not very often in the papers that I read, but at least you know. You know that there will never be one exact TG for a given material. You know that how the glass was formed will change the TG. You know that different analytical methods will give different TG values, and even changing the experimental parameters can change the TG. And most importantly, you know what questions to ask of someone showing you data for an amorphous material. Right, we're done. I wanted to explain why we get different TG values for the same material, and I hope I've done that. If you found the video helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and please tell your friends about the channel. All of that really helps. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.